Good evening and welcome to the Crossroads Career Network webinar tonight. As always, we really appreciate you joining us. My name is Tom Jacobson, and many of you have probably heard our previous webinars and have heard these same introductions before, um, but we're grateful that we have a lot of new people joining us tonight. So I wanna make sure that everyone is aware of what we freely offer through Crossroads so you can take total advantage of the resources available. So if you've heard much of this before, please bear with me. Uh, we'll get to our topic this evening uh, very shortly. On a volunteer basis, I lead the Crossroads out of Woodbury Lutheran Church in Woodbury. However, we have three Twin Cities Crossroads locations. And until we have meetings in person again, uh, we're combining efforts online. So I'm looking forward to our presentation tonight and the topic will be very informative and I, George will thoroughly educate and uh, do his thing. And, uh, but I hope you'll find some encouragement uh, in the pursuit of your next career. I'll give you an overview of what's available through Crossroads, but first I wanna share something that I hope um, might give you some perspective as well. Whether you're a Christian or not, the Bible has some great wisdom, go figure. Like Romans 15, 13, may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. There are so many areas where this would be great for today. Uh, we're, if we're filled with hope, our job search will be more fruitful. Our attitudes toward circumstances will be positive and will beam with God's love. In these days, having the hope of God and the power of the Holy Spirit uh, with us can give us a positive strength to deal with <laughs> what winter is throwing at us right now uh, and lift us beyond the COVID crisis we're in and hopefully stay positive and focused on our job search. Let me begin and open us with a prayer and then I'll give you an overview of what's available through Crossroads this month. Lord, thank you for bringing us together tonight. Help, to, help us to focus on the wisdom that is being shared by Becky and George. Give us this focus to form great questions to ask George to expand our skills and our performance in our job search. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So let me get the slides up here. Oops, well, that was not good. I am having technical difficulties. There we go. And share. There we go. Welcome. So tonight's tonight's agenda um, from seven to seven fifteen. Uh, we'll do this welcome session. Uh, at 7.15 to 7.25, my career crossroads um, with uh, Becky uh, will be next. And then, um, Becky Brister, excuse me. And from 7.25 to 8.25 uh, will be uh, George Dow talking about, uh, you know, job search after 50. And then from uh, 8.25 to 8.30 will be wrap up. So uh, the Twin Cities, Crossroads groups that I alluded to before, um, Minnesota Career Crossroads out of Eden Prairie at Grace Church. Uh, we have the Woodbury location of Minnesota Crossroads Career Network and Woodbury Lutheran Church. And we have the uh, new site out of uh, North Heights Lutheran Church in Arden Hills. Um, so uh, great to have the, all three of us working together, but like we said earlier, like I said earlier, we're all online right now combining our efforts. Uh, for details about each of these locations, you can check that out on uh, uh, minnesotacrossroads.com um, and really get a great overview of what's going on there. Um, like I alluded to, there, our website has a lot of great information on it uh, about our events, our resources. There's jobs posted there. There's uh, career tools. Uh, there's the one-on-one -on -one coaching. There's everything you could think of about um, job search. So please check us out, uh, Minnesota Crossroads Career Network online um, on our website, 
a lot of great information there. I think you'd be astounded at how much is actually there. Uh, our weekly opportunities. Uh, every Thursday morning, uh, we have uh, Networking with Grace, where Wes Tang and Wes Roper uh, lead a group uh, that is focused on networking in the Twin Cities. It's uh, just like this, it's a Zoom session. It's really very productive. Uh, a lot of people are on and uh, you'll find it to be very useful at creating network chains that can help you uh, reach out to your next job, hopefully. So check that out, it's on the website. You can sign up online and get uh, set up so that you can join that, uh, that event every Thursday morning. In addition, we have a one-on-one -on -one coaching online uh, and it's available anytime. And uh, actually, uh, Becky, uh, is, who's going to be speaking next, uh, is one of our leads that area. And uh, um, hopefully she'll address some of the things that uh, you'll find there. But if she doesn't, uh, check it out online and uh, you'll find it to be very useful. About, you'll find help with uh, interviewing, resumes, uh, all sorts of things about job search. So um, please check that out. And, if you're needing a little extra help, uh, maybe a little prayer support, submit your requests uh, through our website and our prayer team will uh, help you address those things uh, that you need help with through prayer. Uh, it's really a, a great tool uh, if you need the extra help, which all of us do from time to time. And then one of the, we think of as the meat and potatoes of Crossroads is our small group classes the Zoom session meetings right now online, but uh, when we're back to meeting in person, uh, there are small group sessions in locations throughout the Twin Cities. So, uh, but they're eight weeks packed with information and uh, techniques and all the things that you need to have a successful job search um, from like assessing your attitude, assessments about your skills, how to network more effectively, how to do the things that are about target networking, um, targeting companies, uh, building a great resume, uh, how to interview successfully for jobs, negotiating once you have a job offer, how do you make, make sure it's the right offer and for the right price and all the things that are necessary to make sure you've chosen well, selecting your, the companies you want to select. So it's eight weeks. Each week is a progressive chain add on and more tools so you can really become proficient at job search. Uh, there's light accountability. There's lots of group uh, where the group gets together and there's the dynamics in there and people form great friendships and working partners and they're going to really be very useful in a job search, especially when all the ups and downs or you need to ask somebody questions and you know get feedback and all those types of things. A lot of great support can be helped in the group sessions where the people are working together. So uh, and it includes exploring God's perspective on job search and a lot of other things. There's great tools uh, around how you can really explore the spirituality components uh, that are necessary to help you through your job search. So new, new classes beginning every uh, month. Uh, check them out. You can sign up online. Uh, there's different times locate, uh, and uh, days through the week. It's really like um, everyone says that it's been through them. It's, it's really a great experience and it really will be helpful to you. So check out our small group classes. I think you'll really find them uh, to be a, a great asset. Um, if you're looking to continue to network and you, you believe LinkedIn has the answers, uh, we have a LinkedIn uh, group online. It's Minnesota Crossroads Career Network. So you punch that into the search bar there on LinkedIn uh, right next to the uh, the uh, IN uh, logo, and uh, you have an opportunity to find, you just type that in, you'll, you can join our group. There's uh, 2,004 members right now, as the screen says, there's probably a little bit more since the screen capture was made. Um, so uh, all those people that are in our group are, uh, have gone through at least, uh, and been a part of helping people with their job search. So um, more than willing to help, uh, there's a lot of great articles on there, chuck full of information, our next speakers, all sorts of things. So uh, check that out. I think you'll find that to be an asset also. Um, our webinars uh, are now uh, are online uh, uh, through YouTube. 
Uh, we have a YouTube channel, so check that out on our website. Uh, you'll find all of the uh, past webinars so that you can check out, let's say you, you really like what George says uh, tonight, uh, but you forgot to write down a few things, you wanna check it out, uh, go to our YouTube uh, channel and, and get more of George in person or you heard that something that Becky said that you, so there's any opportunity that you have, or you wanna go back and, and see um, seminars that you didn't attend. Uh, they're all there. So it's a great asset, uh, YouTube channel. So I would highly recommend you check that out also. Crossroads can't happen without volunteers. Uh, and uh, this is a small sample of our volunteers. It grows every day and there's a lot of smiling faces there. Uh, they look warm and helpful, and uh, trust me, uh, everyone that I've encountered and had when I was in job search or in transition uh, was helpful and, and really had a, a great perspective, and that smiling uh, look that you see in the pictures is what you get. People are really there to help you, and I, I really uh, can't recommend it enough. So uh, that's our volunteers. If you're looking for a church home, and uh, you haven't uh, haven't really found one, but uh, right now you're into streaming online, like everyone else. Uh, we have the uh, the websites up here that for Woodbury Lutheran Org, North Heights Church, and Grace Church. Uh, check out what the streaming opportunities are there for uh, your um, for checking out uh, what's going on in each of these churches on a weekly basis. So. That's Crossroads. Uh, let me get these slides down and uh, um, get it out of the way here so I can introduce uh, Becky, who will be coming up next. Um, Becky Brister, uh, like I said, leads our, um, our online coaching soul care in search ministry through with Crossroads. Uh, you can check that out at minnesotacrossroads.com, one-on-one -on -one coaching. Um, she's... Uh, in, her list of credits as an operational consultant uh, and uh, her past experience makes her great for the opportunities that she's consulting in. She's agile and all those things that are important in business. So uh, I'm gonna introduce and take, let Becky introduce herself even more. Uh, take it away, Becky. Oh, thank you, Tom. I also like to thank Harry as well for asking me to um, be here tonight. Also, I'd like to thank everybody who is out there and take, took time out of their time to be here and just be part of a community that is looking to be able to um, help each other and encourage each other in a time of transition and change. Uh, when Harry first asked me if I would, uh, would do this and he give my success story in transition, my first thought was, does he know something that I don't know because of my, what I was thinking of success and in my words wasn't exactly lining up with what um, he was asking me to do. And so I took a step back uh, and started to think more directly and prayerfully about what he was asking me to do. And these are some of the things and the answers that kind of came to me. So I wanna really be able to bring to you not just my journey maybe, but how my journey came about um, and what I've learned in that process. So first thing that, because I'm a process kind of person and because this is what I do, the first thing I had to do is break it down. So I said, all right, well, what is transition anyway? Maybe I'm not thinking correctly about that. Um, and so I, of course, looked that up. I was looking at the end, of course. I, and I think that most of us, as we jump into or get pushed into a job search, that's what, we're, that's what we do. We go, okay, well, the end is I need another job. And so we spend all of our time and energy looking at that. And so what I did is I went back and I said, okay, this is a successful transition. What does that look like? The actual definition of transition is um, the process or period of change from one state or condition to another. And so that helped me to realign my, my eyes to the actual journey between here and the next thing that you're looking for. So, um, Bring that, to, I brought that to the table and said, okay, all right, now I'm, I'm looking more directly at what transition really is. Um, yes, the end goal is important to me and that is what um, we're all looking for, but maybe my end goal, maybe my sights on the end goal aren't completely correct. And so I'm trying to maybe look more at that actual transition. 
the next thing that I needed to look at then was um, my current idea of what success was. And I'm a very kind of goal driven kind of person throughout my whole life. And so um, there has been times within my life at other times in transition, both from work and or projects uh, with work or family that I would come to that spot and wonder if I was really successful or not. Um, and at one of those times, I had reached out um, into the word and looked for that spot where, how would I know and what does God think is successful, uh, which was important to me. So, and, and at that moment, what he had given me was uh, 2 Timothy 4, 7. And so at this point in time, Paul is talking to Timothy about um, the next transition that he was looking at and also looking backwards at what he had done and what maybe in, in the, the future of Timothy. And so um, it, it, for me, it was just this one verse that spoke really, really directly to me what he thought um, constituted success for him. And that, and, and that verse states, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. And at that moment in time, um, that spoke very highly to me about what I was doing and being um, content and um, successful at what he had told me. Uh, so I'm going to spend the rest of this time talking you through my journey and my transition using these three steps. Um, so first of all, la uh, July 2019, I was laid off from uh, a company that I had worked at for 13 years. I had worked my way up to the director level. I had driven change in every area of the company. And as part of that, and as the roles that I played um, in this company that is an ERP development and an implementation company, I also had the opportunity to work with nearly 100 other companies and help them change and, and help them implement what their goals were. Uh, in that process, I realized what my real joy was there was working with people, with the people in those processes, um, it, you know, in, in bringing to them the kind of encouragement and truth that they could, they could be successful and they could make their change happen in their lives. And so, well, that, that was a very stressful at time jo times job and there was movement all the time. And I felt like I had figured out how change happens because about every 18 months I would change my role and do something different. And, and so I had convinced myself that I was a really good change artist for myself. Um, but now I had to realize that that was done and that was finished. And so those people that that mission was over for me and God had planned it that way. And I needed to, make that first step in my successful transition, which is fight the good fight. And so I needed to start to fight that fight to be able to let go of that position, those people, all of it, all of what I had there and start to look forward and, and to be able to look at that in a positive light. Well, there, there was certainly at times in that, that job a fight, the fight really that needed to be happening here and that I needed to finish was to be able to bring my emotions and my feelings um, and my thinking in line with what I knew it to be. Um, even though I, I knew that it was um, the right thing for both of us, I had come to really, I'd left with really good terms with them. It was a good choice for both of us. What really took me by surprise was the grief and the loss that I, I did feel in that process. And it wasn't something that I was prepared for. I jumped right in and crossroads and other places and how, exactly how I was gonna get to that new end, uh, but didn't really understand that the transition and doing that tradition, that transition really well meant dealing with some of those feelings because in order to get that next, as maybe a lot of you have realized, you need to put your, you need to be your best and positive and, and best self when you go to an interview or when you're looking at jobs, even to find the one that's best for you. And without dealing with some of that loss that I had, um, it becomes very difficult to do that. And so there, there was some times when I needed to just work on that. And so this is where Crossroads came into my life. And I had gone um, is about a year ago this time, I really jumped into all of those things that you need to do. I, I 
you know, had the list, I'm working my list, I'm doing the things I need to do because that's what happens, that's how you get to the end. And I'd visited a number of different networking groups, I'd visited, um, I'd used the career force, I'd used all kinds of different things, all with some very good and, and right knowledge and helpful tools and um, I attended some classes. I um, went back to school and got did a little mini MBA, and then I got like he's like Tom said, I did an Agile Project Management certification to go with my experience. I was doing, I was hitting all the boxes, but when I came to Crossroads, I really felt like my heart had found home, and a group of people who really cared that had a place where I felt safe and could. Um, could really maybe blossom and see myself in different ways. And so it was a place where, where I could see some steps that I could take, but it also was a place where there was people who genuinely cared. And not that they, they weren't other places too, but this was where God had showed me was my place to be. And so I started out with all of it. I, I did the networking with Grace. I did small groups, I did seminars, I did some one-on-one, -on -one, um, all of them really valuable and met some really great people. And as that time went on and I started and I was doing those things, um, I was really wanting to do that next step too, which was finish the race. And so I needed to finish this race and get to that end. I needed to be, to be successful at that, that race needed to end um, and it needed to end soon. And so this was the place I was going to, I was going to find that place, that, that end. Um, this is when God showed me that uh, I was needed to focus more on the journey uh, and, and a little less on the end. Not that the end wasn't there, but I needed to be present in each, each an individual day and be really open to what was coming in my, in my direction and, and, um, and parts of that had to do with what I was doing. So I, well, I did all of those, all of those things with 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 Crossroads. I also uh, really had a desire to volunteer, and something that while I was working, I didn't really feel like I had time or energy to to do. And so I looked into some different areas of volunteer. And every time I came to Crossroads, there was another little tug that said, "You should be here. You should be here, maybe." And um, and so I'll talk more about that later, but with that process, um, and then also, I, I also volunteer with SCORE um, to help small businesses and, and found that to be something that really was feeding my soul um, during this time of transition as I looked into what might be that end of that race. And so the race and that journey for me took me through resumes and branding, interviews, business building, some things that like I said, that really fed my soul with the volunteer work. Um, and then there was just all of those things that were happening from January through February. And then of course, March hit and there came COVID. Um, and uh, along with that, a cancer walk with my mom to her new heavenly home uh, last July. And so it was at that point when I realized through some prayer and, medica and meditation, that God was really speaking to me that that was my job at that time. That was the thing that he wanted me to do. I was to care for her and make that uh, part of my life, um, the job for me at that time, the end for me at that time. Uh, once that was done, um, you know, now I needed to look on to what is that's, you know, so far, so far, good, right? I've, I've got a successful transition, but I still haven't arrived at that end that I was so, that I thought I was so look, hard looking for. Um, and during that time, different things have changed and, and different draws have happened. And so right now what I'm doing is I am working at, working with my husband in his business. He's got a small business, a solar entrepreneur, and I've been working with him on some business organization and planning. And I've also been following Christ just every day to see what he has for me. I, it may be, um, it maybe goes in a lot of different directions, but I really want to be available for people to speak truth and, and joy into their lives um, and find a way to do that where God wants me to do it on each individual day. 
he continues to sp supply those uh, physical needs and ways that I don't really understand all the time, but I'm going to be willing to trust that he will guide me to the next step when that is appropriate. So um, here we are at the last of our um, steps, which is, I, and I have kept the faith. And so I really believe that at this moment, while I've not had every day of a rock hard, rock solid kind of faith, there certainly has been days of tears and fears and wondering where I was going the next day. But I can say that I have not, um, and with his help, I have not lost faith that whatever my next step is, um, is still part of a successful transition and the end will be when he says there's an end um, and it keeps changing. Uh, so that kind of drives me to the end here where I wanted to um, let you know a little bit more about what happened with Crossroads and that was Harry and I had opportunity um, last August to spend a little more time and that's where Soul Care came out of. And so I really appreciate Harry and his um, encouragement and his ability and desire to include me. So I would encourage you if any part of what I've talked about as far as uh, just working through the, the different areas of your transition um, and if you feel like it would benefit you to have somebody to be able to talk to on a real um, just sole basis and say, you know, what needs to be said and, and just be able to let things out, I would uh, encourage you to reach out um, and I would love to be able to in, engage with you. The um, there are a lot of other one-on-one uh, -on -one kind of, of coaching, and I have done some interview prep and things like that, but um, I, am a, I am a safe space where you can um, feel comfortable and be able to work through some of those steps in your, in your, in your transition and, ex and getting to that successful transition. So, um, that's what that's my story as as far as it has gone and i really um appreciate you being here and listening and if you have any questions please reach out to harry or somebody in it and i will certainly get back to you thank you well thank you becky that was uh and very insp inspirational and enlightening i appreciate you doing that thank you um and uh, if you're interested, please reach out to Becky because uh, I think that's uh, very useful too. Uh, at this time, I'd like to uh, introduce George, but first I'd also like to say thank you to Harry who's in the background, uh, who's doing all of the, uh, um, the little things that make this thing go off. So thank you, Harry, uh, for doing that. Harry Urschel, who uh, leads Crossroads, the whole group, and uh, who is uh, obviously the, uh, the maestro tonight. So thank you, Harry. Uh, I'm happy to introduce George and his topic in uh, interviewing af after age 50 and how to evaluate what you can do about it. Um, over the past 30 years, George's career transition clients have been mostly over 50. Uh, his session will have relevance for all ages though, and I hope you find it useful. Uh, over the past 10 years, George has been an executive career coach um, for those in transition in solo practice. Uh, he's, he serves director to CEO level and clients. Uh, you can find out more about that at www.georgedow.com. Uh, prior to this, George was vice president of executive career transition consulting at Wright Management. Uh, and his focus on assisting clients with their career assessment and identifying options and coaching uh, to achieve desired outcomes for their professional lives and their personal lives. Uh, if you have questions for George uh, during this presentation, like uh, we're gonna take a break at the 20 minute mark. So put them in the chat area uh, and uh, Harry and George will interact over those questions and you'll find that to be very enlightening. So please, uh, if you have questions for George, put them in the chat area and they will be answered hopefully. Uh, and uh, Without further ado, George Dow. Thank you, Tom. Oh, and now I'm unmuted. And let's see, let me get this to uh, the slideshow. And of course, uh, 
It always takes a second to remember how exactly. I just got a new, oh, there we go. I think we've got it set now. And uh, what you're gonna see in front of you is uh, the topic, interviewing after age 50, as Tom said, that's been most of my clients, especially in the last 10 years, but over the 21 years that I was at Right Management, uh, I typically worked with executives that tended to be in the 50, 60 uh, year age group. And I also would always do workshops uh, for the entire group that was coming through uh, outplacement with career transition at Bright Management. And what I would do is the workshops called, it's not the age, it's the attitude. So that gave me the opportunity to numerous times focus on this question of um, being over 50 and how you not, might need to make some adjustments because of that. And perhaps some of the most helpful advice I got, and I'll probably be channeling this to you uh, throughout this presentation, is for the most of that 21 year period at Right Management, we'd have recruiters come by every month. And those recruiters would take about two hours and they would present, they'd open up their their minds and our souls to us, they always felt a little guilty that they couldn't spend more time with, uh, with our clients. We normally have about 30 executive clients in the room. So I, at a certain point, I thought I could give their speeches for them. So you will notice that as I present, uh, a lot of their wisdom uh, and their, their preferences will be revealed in, in what I have to say. So I'm gonna cover the eight ways that you'll be evaluated in a job interview, um, the five stages of the interviewing process, and then three key elements uh, of the nego negotiating process. I tend to like to put things in, into numbers so you can see that through, through this presentation. And let me start with uh, the eight ways you'll be evaluated. And with each of these eight points, I'm gonna be coming at it with an angle that uh, relates to being over 50. Uh, I'm well over 50, so I'm, I'm living in this space. And uh, as Tom said, when, when I'm done with this part, I'll take about 20 minutes to get through this part. And then uh, along the way, I do encourage you to write down your questions in, in the chat box so that uh, Harry can read them and, and uh, vet them for you know, what, what we wanna talk about at the break. So let's get started with first preparation. And I'm gonna share with you a lot of things that might seem obvious, then I'll, I'll throw you a lot of curveballs along the way because again, over these 30 years of doing this work, uh, I've understand that still a lot of realities of, of interviewing but then there's nuances too. So here's, a, here's one that seems obvious, but I'm, here's your curveball. Preparation, of course. We all know that we need to you know, learn about the company, learn about the organization, the, uh, the job itself, read the job specifications, and all the things you might think about doing, talking to people, researching on the internet, going to LinkedIn, getting information about the job, the organization, the people. But here's the catch. Don't over-prepare. One of the things that's really important to remember is that you're not competing against the job specifications, you're competing as other candidates. You might even feel like you're more qualified than most of your competition. But here's what often is happening. If you're in transition, you, you're probably one of uh, maybe four finalists or five or six finalists. Many of the people that you're competing with are employed and they don't have a whole lot of time to be researching uh, like you might have if you're in transition. So they can sometimes come across as more believable, more authentic because they're not overly prepared, but they're present and they're reacting in the moment. Uh, they don't know it all. They haven't had hours and hours and hours to prepare. And what's more, they have meetings scheduled probably within an hour of the interview or two. So here's the recommendation I, I would hear often from uh, recruiters, they'd say, have an appointment set an hour or two after your interview. See beyond the interview. Prepare, but don't over-prepare. Have a life beyond this opportunity because one of the easiest things to do, especially if you're over 50 and you're putting so much weight on this job opportunity, you might put too much onto it. You've got to have opportunities beyond what you're interviewing for so you don't put too much energy and weight so that you don't look like you're desperately prepared and desperately approaching the opportunity. So prepare, but don't over-prepare and recognize that when you get into the interview, you don't wanna be presenting right away. You wanna be in the moment, present for wherever it might take you and not try to take over the process because you know so much about the company, about the job. And so uh, prepare, but don't over-prepare. 
Second point is ability. You're going to be evaluated on whether or not you have the ability to do this work, and especially that you've been there and done that before. Uh, the best predictor of future performance, of course, is prior performance in some similar circumstances. We've probably all heard that in one version or another. So what I like to recommend is a three-column approach, where the first column would be the top 10 needs that the employer has. For this job, what do they need? List out the top 10 things. The middle column is your qualifications, your experience, your abilities. Beside each of those top 10, what are your abilities? Can you do that work? And so you establish, yes, you can do probably eight or nine or 10 out of 10. But the third column is perhaps the most important because the third column is proof. It's evidence that is in the story form, uh, which my favorite version, the acronym of CAR, Challenge Action Results. And why, why do I like CAR? It's because that's how the human brain likes to think. When you tell a story, you're offering proof that you've been there, you've done that. And when you start with the challenge, they understand the context of, of that you've been there before. Okay, that's the situation that looks like our situation. What actions did you take? And try not to get lost in, the, in, a, in a team or a group where you give off too much away to your teammates, but rather, how, how did you lead that team? How did you make sure that that um, initiative was successful? So what role did you play, your actions? And then finally, the most important part is the results. Um, measurable, if at all possible, growing revenue, reducing cost results. And again, this might seem obvious, but here's what often happens, even with the really successful and smart people I work with, they talk about the challenge, they talk about the actions, and then they forget the results. They forget to mention that it was successful and to speak to how successful it was. So always remember in your mind, when you're talking about your ability, it's it's your challenge you faced, the actions you took, and absolutely remember the results. And as you're thinking about your stories, here's another reference to being over 50. Be careful not to go way, way back and the this, this story took place 30, 40 years ago. Try to find the last five years, maybe 10 years, because they want to know that your best days are not way behind you, but fairly recent. Your abilities are current. Your, your experiences are are, are relevant for right now. One of the things that uh, I remember reading in a Fortune article several years ago was about job search after 50. The interesting thing that the author said was, if you're over 50, be current and be in shape because being in shape means you take good care of yourself. You've got good energy because you take good care of yourself. Maybe you're fit. Um, but the part about be current means do you, are you reading or, or, or learning or having conversations to make sure that you're current in your profession? Because one of the things about those of us over 50 is that we're often viewed as being dated, that our information is from long ago and we won't be able to keep up because things have changed so much. So how have you kept up? How have you stayed current? How have you stayed ahead of the game, ideally? So those are the abilities that, that matter a lot. Motivation, the third point, is about your drive, your energy. It's about your achievements. That's why those of us that are career coaches, anybody who's helping you is going to talk to you about achievements. And achievements means where, you know, in, in a resume, for instance, you'll have the duties, the nature and scope of your duties in a paragraph form is what I prefer. And the bullets below that are your achievements. And achievements are winning awards, uh, growing revenues beyond expectations, reducing costs, um, winning awards, uh, getting fast promotions, those kinds of things. So there are tangible things that, that are stories that you can tell, examples you can tell about, achieve, about motivation, but it's mostly your energy. It's your presence. How energized are you? You don't want to come to an interview tired, worn out, um, fatigued from overly preparing, for instance, but rather to be present, to have good energy, and to show that you're motivated to be an achiever. Everybody wants to hire an achiever. Maintainers don't do well in job interviews for the most part, but achievers tend to stand out and be the preferred candidate. The next point is fit. And this one came up all the time. And sometimes it would get into that, quality, that category of life can be seem unfair. But when those recruiters, for all those years I was at Red Management and hearing those monthly presentations by recruiters, they would very consistently say a fit is number one. And the, and, and the candidates would 
would would wonder, does that mean ability isn't isn't as important? And the recruiters would say this, we will find candidates, the top four candidates will all have the ability to do the job. We'll find them. And they'll all have drive, they'll have motivation and, and high drive. But the question really is who will fit? Who will be getting along with the people above, beside, and below? Who is going to be a good fit? Because if you've got the ability and you've got the drive, but you don't get along interpersonally, it's not going to work. So what these recruiters and, and hiring managers are looking for is, what are you like to work with? And again, when you, when you get into the interview, and especially when you get into the finals, all your competitors will be able to say a lot of the things you can say, if not all the things you can say. So what sets you apart is how you do the things you do. And so that is, uh, that is a reality. And those of you that have done hiring out there, you, you know, I think you probably agree. People want people that get along and do well working with others. So after fit, integrity. Um, one of the things about you know, resumes, for instance, and, and what you share as you before the interview is that resume, how far back does it go? And there's a lot of debate on this one, and you can go either way, be inclusive all the way to college or uh, your earliest job, or go back 15, 10, 15, 20 years. When I would hear the recruiters talk, they would say, we want to know the whole story. We're going to ask you about everything. We're going to ask you to tell us your story. And so my bias is, even though you're worried about age discrimination, my bias tends to be to go all the way back to your first job um, out of college or, or your first job that, that was um, a significant job, not the high school jobs, but the significant jobs um, in your 20s, early 20s. And so, you know, you might disagree, you might be nervous about this, but I think if you really get down to it, no matter what your age is, trust is probably the biggest factor in the hiring process. Employers need to know that they can trust you. And so integrity and trust means that you are telling the truth, you're telling uh, a complete story. And always remember that you're gonna, you're gonna wonder about those stories where they say, tell me about a weakness or you know, tell me about a time when you really screwed up. And what they're really looking for is are you the type of person that, and I'll give, you, I'll give you a sequence to help you on this one. They're wondering this, you're human, so you've made mistakes, you've come up short. Do you accept responsibility? Do you take action to correct the problem quickly? Do you learn from it so that the next time you're not gonna make that mistake or you're more, or less likely to make that mistake? So my belief is that when people ask you about the weakness question or where you come up short, um, my belief is that we don't have to have a, a loaded gun pointed at our foot, but rather we each come up short from time to time. And they're really wondering, um, do you have any glaring shortcomings or do you have the kind of uh, personality where you can say, you know, I recognize when I, have a shortcoming or I have a gap in my knowledge or my skills. And what I do is I acknowledge that gap and I do something to fill it as, as well as I can. You know, I, I heard uh, Becky was talking about taking courses at St. Thomas, I think a mini MBA or something like that. And no matter what age we are, uh, there are courses um, on the internet or courses at continuing education. But we wanna, we wanna be able to share that we're current we're learners and that whatever we might be coming up short on, whether it's abilities or, or our education or knowledge or whatever, is there something you can do about that? Is there something you are doing about that? And so people just wanna know that you, you don't hide things under the rug, that you accept responsibility, that you're responsible for your own future, your own education and continual development so that you're a more attractive candidate um, and we can talk more about that. If there's some questions in the chat room, uh, chat box, I will, I will listen to them from Harry if, if you want to know more about that. So that's integrity, trust and integrity. The next uh, one is related to that, and that's sponsorship. Because sponsorship, I'm probably preaching to the choir for a lot of you. Um, you've heard this statistic most likely that 60 to 80 
65 to 80% of jobs tend to have a network sponsor attached to them. So whenever I talk to my, my clients, I'll say, well, probably you should spend about 65 to 80% of your time networking because that's where the jobs tend to be. So why is that, that sponsorship is so important? Well, when you think about um, that interview process, you're asking the, the people that are doing the hiring process to trust you, to trust that what you're saying is true, to trust that you are the same person in this interview that you'll be if you get the job. And what happens is in most cases, especially the more senior you are, the more likely this will be is people need to vouch for whether or not you're telling the truth. People wanna find out from people they respect the objective truth about you, or at least a little bit more objective truth. We're, we're all the fox guarding our own hen house, right? Uh, we, we tend to see the greatness in ourselves, but what recruiters want and hiring managers want is that other people are also pointing towards you. Other people are validating you. Other people are saying the things that they wanna hear that what you're speaking is the truth and, and they wanna hear more about you. And especially if there's some connection between the hiring manager or, or the organization and who your common connection is. So sponsorship is, is quite important. Um, and then attitude, um, here's another one where I'll talk about kind of a, a curveball. I had a client once that I did a, a video interview with him and it's really interesting the difference between the words that he chose and the visuals that I saw. He was probably about 55 years old and, and he had come from a large corporation and, in, and he had moved to a smaller business. And you could tell when I asked him some questions in that video that his attitude was a superior attitude because he'd come from this sophisticated large company, he had his own level of, of, of skill that was quite high. But when I asked him about his former employer, especially the boss, the owner of the company, what I heard from him was probably the right words if I could just read a script, but the tone was venomous. The tone was angry. He had baggage. It's as if he had the right script, but the wrong music, <laughs> the wrong tone. Uh, you could tell by his body language. And these days, even though, you know, we're doing these interviews on Zoom, they can see you. They can see how your body language is. They can see what your, what your, um, your posture is. So what I'd encourage you to do is to think about um, both the words and the, the tone and the body language so that your attitude is one that is, is certainly positive and, and recognize that there are certain triggers that each of us have. And quite often it's former employers or reason for leaving or experiences from the past where we might have some leftover uh, anger, resentment, energy. And if that sneaks out, even when the words are right, we have to work on our body language, our tone and our attitude about the past. And quite often I have to spend a fair amount of time with my clients to, to answer that reason for leaving statement. Um, and basically the net of that is, um, we all have to take the high road. You can't slam your former company or boss and you can't slam yourself. So attitude is that positivity, but it's also uh, making the words and the music match and not being a Pollyanna, but uh, having the attitude of, of being a positive um, can-do person, but also authentic and real, not to become a chameleon, not just become, because whoever they hire, if they hire you, they wanna know you. So be authentic, but be your best self. It's kind of like a driver's test. I tell my clients, you know, you, you'll never drive that. You're going to be a really good driver on your driver's test and you can let up a little bit after the uh, driver's test, after you get your license. But the reality is that we have to be in our best behavior, but still be real. The last point, and then I'll open it up to questions. So again, if you've got, if I've generated some thoughts that you have some questions, uh, please put them in, in the box and Harry's going to ask me those, your questions after this next point. Competitive, I just wanna reiterate that point I made a little earlier that you're not competing against the job specifications, you're competing as other candidates. So one thing I heard from a recruiter named David Meiji was that if, if you could take those first two columns that I referenced earlier, the first column again is the ability, what abilities do they are they looking for for filling this job? And then uh, what's your capabilities, your capabilities relative to those top 10 needs that the employer has, you could look at maybe adding a third column, which would be your competition. 
what's your competition likely to say with regard to what the employers need? You've answered what you've got relative to their needs. What do you think the competition would say about their capabilities compared to the needs of the employer? And what David would say is cross out everything that's equal. If you're likely to have the same capabilities as your competition, that's kind of a wash. But what do you have in your column that's, that's your competitive advantage? And what do they have in their column that's their advantage? And how do you leverage your advantages for a competitive advantage? And how do you mitigate their advantages to try to get at um, how you can understand that maybe are there some things you need to work on? There's some, some skills or knowledge or whatever you need to add. Or is, is there the points that they have maybe not as big a deal? Because face it, um, most people have about 80, 90% of, of what's really needed uh, for a job. And maybe there's always gonna be a bit of a gap for each of us as far as um, what we bring to the table. So why don't I stop right there? I'm gonna stop screen sharing and I'm gonna turn to Harry right now because he's, he's been looking over your questions. And if, if there aren't a lot of questions, Harry make some up and then, then we'll, uh, we'll go from there. Thanks, George. We don't have questions yet, certainly waiting for some. We do, a couple are starting to come up, but uh, we're, I'm glad you referenced David Magee. He actually is watching tonight. And uh, Oh, he is, David. He really, David, <laughs> thanks for being so smart and, and wise. <laughs> he's asking, did he really say that? What you told <laughs> him? <laughs> I can't but, remember the year, but you see, we worked at the same firm for years, uh, Career Dynamics. Uh, David's a great guy. He is. So, He's done other presentations for us. I'm really grateful to have him here tonight. He's the one I learned from. He was the first person I, I watched do a workshop like this. So David, thank you for that. You got me started. Um, one of the questions that came up is uh, for years, we're asked something like, where do you see yourself in 10 years from now? Now in your <laughs> 50s, how do you answer that? You know, it's a really, it, you know, it, in your 50s, it depends on how close you are to 65 in some ways. But I think that there's, there's three things that um, I always ask people about. I say, so is this the right job? Is this the right organization, including the boss? Is it the right personal factors? So there's a lot of things to consider uh, of what we want uh, in, in the immediate future and then five, 10 years from now. And I think oftentimes the question will be, how long will this be a, a, a good job for you? How, how fast do you want to move up? And employers really want to know if this job right in front of you is the job that is, is going to engage you, make you passionate, and that's a good fit for you and where you have great skills for it. And we can't always say how quickly we want to move up, and maybe we don't want to move up to the next level. Some people are comfortable uh, staying at, a, at whatever level they're at, but you have to decide. Um, it's a kind of a judgment call, it's somewhat subjective about how quickly you wanna move up. But the most important thing they wanna know is, is this job right in front of you gonna make you passionate? Are you gonna do a great job? Is it gonna make you excited about going to work every day? And how long will that last? You know, I think looking at what's in front of you, if you can get excited about the job, about the organization, and about uh, you know, any other, other factors about uh, you know, the organization, the job, the, the people, I think, you have to decide at this stage of your career, you want to show that you're ambitious. You want to show that you, you want to keep growing. Can you keep growing in this job? Well, let's hope you can for, for the foreseeable future, but you do want to show that you're ambitious in an appropriate way. Not It's sort of like the Goldilocks formula, not too aggressive, not too passive or slow, but what is the spot right in the middle for you where you're ambitious enough, not because what they worry about, and here's the number one thing they worry about is if it's a step down, for instance, if it's, if it's a lower level, one or two levels low, can you still be motivated? Or are you gonna be there six weeks and say, I want the next job now? Uh, the bosses are worried that you'll be more overqualified for a job, a lesser, lower job. I have to tell you my, my most popular blog I ever did, uh, the title was uh, From Overqualified to When Can You Start? And what I did with this, uh, with this blog is that it was a real person that I work with. I said to her, she called me on a Wednesday and I said, okay, you've got a job that's one or two levels lower than where you've been. 
she said, yeah, they, they called me. It was a Wednesday. They, they said on Friday, we're going to let you know if we think you're still a candidate because we're worried that you're overqualified because this is the big issue we worry about, you know, being an older worker. And I said those three things. I said, is this a job you can get excited about? And, and can you anticipate for you know, two or three years or, or perhaps more, this would be energizing to you. And then maybe you could move up, but, but not so quickly that they'd think you're overqualified and get bored too soon. She said, yes, this is a very engaging, stimulating job. So I said, the second question, how about the organization and, and the boss? She said, it's a great organization or I know the boss. I, I, think, I think that it's a great situation. And the third question I said is, personally, this is a, a relocation to California. Um, it's more expensive to live in California. The personal factors are significant. How do you feel about that? She said, well, you know what? I, I like the area. Um, and by the way, my, my son, my daughter-in-law and my grandson lives in this city where this company is located. So I said, okay, so now the, the job itself, the organization and the boss and the personal, all our green lights. It was a Wednesday. I said, they're going to let you know on Friday. I tell you what, You've told me the three things that you want all three of them, even though it's a level or two down, um, I want you to call them right now. Sometimes, you know, coaches aren't supposed to be quite that directive, but I can get really directive if I see something that needs to be done. I said, call them now. Tell them those three things you just told me. That I love the job, it'd be stimulating, be engaging for the for, for several years probably. The organization's great, the boss, I'd love to work with you. and. You know, she hadn't mentioned about the grandson because she's in human resources and she thought, oh, I don't, I can't touch that because, you know, that's personal. I said, they can't ask you about your family, but you can tell them about your family. So she did. She said, and my grandson lives in, in this area. So I would love to, um, to work for you. And uh, she got the offer the next day on Thursday. What if she had waited till Friday? Um, she might, they might've thought that she thought she's overqualified not excited enough about a job a level or two lower. So I took a little extra time with that because that's the most popular blog I've ever done. It got hundreds of, of hits. So uh, for what it's worth, I think that's one of the biggest things that comes up. What if this job isn't as big a job? Can I still be engaged? Well, you have to answer that question, but hopefully it will be. All right, Harry, I gave people enough chance to ask more questions. Fire away. We've got a number of them. Uh, one quick one you mentioned earlier to uh, create a list with three columns of needs, abilities, and they're asking what was the third column? Third one is stories. The third one is stories. And again, uh, in a car format, challenge, action, results. And if you have all three of those lined up, um, then in advance of coming in, you have a sense of what they need. And in just a few moments, I'm going to talk to you about how to put it all together uh, in your close. Someone else is asking, how do you get more information about uh, the needs they have beyond the posted, what's posted in the job descriptions so that you can answer all their needs? Sure, you know, what do they need? Yeah, they've got the posting and sometimes those postings are, can be dated. So you have to be careful. Um, sometimes you can go through your LinkedIn and find people who have worked at that company to learn about, about the company. Uh, you can certainly make sure you ask enough clarifying questions while you're in the job interview, because you might have several people with several different ideas. And each person you talk to might have their own angle on what they need, what their preferences are for this job. So in a way, you form it ahead of time, what they need, what you've got, and what your stories are. But it's, it's sort of like improvisational comedy or theater. You, you have several things lined up as best you can in advance, not overly prepared. But when you go into the interview, you have to be very receptive to what is being said by each individual person. You've got to ask clarifying questions and be able to think on your feet for what does this person sitting across from me really need? And then form your, your uh, answers of your capabilities and then have your story in the challenge action results. Uh, ready to formulate on the spot. That's why you have to be well rested and you've got to be very present in order to be able to do that. And don't come across as scripted or canned or uh, have all your lines ready for, for a, a, a theater. It's improv. It's not uh, lines that you've rehearsed before a play. How does one best communicate multiple experiences that they've had in their career? If you had different lines of careers. So if you've had uh, different kinds of careers, um, I suspect that uh, what you're trying to do is to look for the golden threads 
that relate to the job that you're interviewing for. So what you're trying to do is to figure out, you know, why did you move to these different occupational directions? And how does it link to this opportunity? Um, that there's some versatility in that. There's some really positives about versatility where you can move to different jobs, maybe different industries uh, over time. They'll wonder what your preference is and if your preference is for the work that you're, that's in front of you in this job interview. But I think that uh, that's the two things I'd say, try to link what you've done with what they need. And again, the big three are always ability, motivation, and fit. So um, what in your, your various jobs uh, can, can you connect the dots for what is relevant to this job, this organization, so they understand how your background is relevant. With all this diverse background experiences, how is it relevant? How did it prepare you to be a good candidate for this job? Terrific. One of the questions is from John Amadeo, and I, I know him, I've uh, or known him. He's been in Boston now, so I'm glad to have people from around the country. Actually, if uh, for others as well, if you can uh, put in the chat room where you're from, if you're from out of the uh, Minnesota area, I'd love to hear about it. Thanks for joining us. Um, he says, as a recruiter for 20 years, I've seen recruiters use their internal bias to reverse engineer dates on a resume. Isn't including everything on your resume back to maybe even the 70s or 80s extremely limiting when it comes to securing interviews? So, uh, so it's a question of, are, are you worried about age discrimination? I think that's why it's a judgment call uh, you'll, you'll have to be prepared, though, to go all the way back. If, if you're worried about it being a screen that you'll be knocked out because you're going back so far, um, you know, I think you can make the case for going back 20 years, maybe 15 to 20 years. Um, I just think you have to be ready in the interview. If it's a recruiter or if it's a hiring manager, they will figure out your age. They'll figure out by going back to ask for your work history. What did you do you know, after high school, after college? you'll get those questions. So if you wanna make it so that you answer those questions in the, in the interview, uh, that's one thing, but there are other realities that you might be eliminated just simply because you left so many things out and you don't go back far enough, they'll assume you're an older uh, candidate anyway. So this one, I think you could debate it back and forth both sides of this issue and be interesting to hear <laughs> some other recruiters respond to this. David, I know you're out there. Uh, what would you say, David, if you're if you want to put in the chat box, go all the way back to college or uh, jobs or or not? If you're still there, David, if, if you're still awake, if I haven't put you to sleep. Uh, my opinion on this actually is just that I think own it. You don't have to put dates on everything back. They may or may not figure it out, but uh, you are your experience is what it is. And it's uh, valuable to the right employer. And if it's really a, a, that big of an issue, that may not be the right employers for you. So I think sometimes we try to create something when there really isn't anything there to start with. Um, oh, I see David's name in there. So there's David weighing in. Coming up, he says, uh, most of my clients are small or medium employers and they value the experience of the candidate. I vote going back proudly. I agree with David. Yeah, go back proudly. That's the main thing. Don't hide it. Because if you hem and haw and you're looking like you're hiding things and defensive, it's, had, it's hard to have the trust. I agree. Question is uh, from uh, Ginny and she says, thanks for all the great info. She says, do you have any suggestions about how to overcome potential skepticism about your technical skills due to the, being a mature worker? <laughs> well, the question again, when you start with this needs qualification stories, uh, you're gonna wanna be probing um, and maybe talking to your network about what is needed uh, for this line of work that you're in. And quite often, I think that, um, you have a reality that you have your skills, you have your technical capabilities, they are what they are. And at the same time, sometimes while in transition, I've had a lot of clients that have been taking coursework while they're in transition to try to bone up on, on different uh, technical capabilities, the language, um, you know, the currency, whatever is current. Uh, I think it's important to find out what is valued and whether or not you need to maybe address that. Um, but you have to kind of tell it like it is. And, and sometimes you have to see your glasses half full, even though you know you might be missing some things. Can you fill that gap? Can you start to fill that gap? 
um, at least you show the effort when you're when you're working on it and maybe taking some coursework uh, to fill the gap. David chimed in on that one says don't bring a blackberry. <laughs> That's right, David. Don't bring a blackberry. <laughs> yeah, you go on the current, you know. <laughs> so I could um, take one more, Harry, and then I should probably get back to the next part. Sounds great. Um, since I've been asked for my date of graduation from college recently, can an employer really ask that? When did you graduate from college? Right. Uh, it's not an illegal question, is it, Harry? And not to my knowledge. No. Illegal questions are about, you know, sexual preference, religion, um, you know, some of the obvious things about uh, discrimination, but if they're just asking for a data point, which is a date of graduation, um, you know, you have to be careful because you start to wonder, okay, are they building a case uh, to, to just get the information? Are they, is this age discrimination going on here? I think the thing that is a concern of mine sometimes is if a client of mine starts getting asked uh, questions that you start to wonder how how is that that's maybe too personal or it's starting to border on or, or moving into illegal the best response i think is can you tell me how that relates to the job uh, so if you start to worry about getting asking really oftentimes smaller employers will ask a lot of questions that maybe they're not as trained in, in appropriate interviewing. So you can always come back and say, tell me how that relates to the job uh, and without being defensive, but you know, that's kind of covers that category of illegal questions. But you know, I think they can, they can ask when you graduate from college. So let me shift back now. I'm gonna go back to my screen share and get back to the next part. Make sure I cover all these things that I want to cover. And we'll get back for some more questions at the end. So here we are back to um, the eight ways you'll be evaluated. And I'm going to go to the next screen, which is the five stages of the interviewing process. So this is, this is a rough cut for how things evolve in, in an interview. Introductions, uh, and again, I'm thinking way back to 1989 when David Meiji was was giving a presentation, I'm, and I realize I'm channeling some of his his words. Uh, he would say the interview starts when you walk in, and the receptionist uh, looks you over, and they wonder, you know, how are you in responding to the receptionist in those days? And these days, the receptionist maybe is not going to be a factor because we're all on Zoom, but. Uh, eventually we'll get back to some in-person interviewing, but uh, the idea is to, is to recognize that you're going to be evaluated uh, from everybody you touch, everybody that sees you. Now, uh, think about, I mean, I've made some choices myself in, in the introductions. I've got uh, a background that's, that's not my background, but uh, it's an internet purchased uh, or background and I've got a green screen behind me. I'm trying to, uh, here's a little trick that I learned about what's happening now. I've got a monitor in front of my notebook computer that's about three feet away. And I'm looking at you as if I'm looking at your eyes, but I'm really looking at a screen behind my screen. And what's happening is that in these days, people wonder about eye contact. And it's so hard to have eye contact because you look at that little camera to the left of the, the dot and that's uh, or you look down as I'm looking down right now. So one of the things about introductions is if you can find some way to have a background and I use a green screen and I got mine on Amazon for $89 and true confession, here's what it looks like. It's an oval screen, <laughs> uh, open kimono as they say. So um, what it does is it makes it so that it doesn't have the blurry effect um, like you get with the, the, the artificial backgrounds. But these days um, they're gonna see you and you wanna look, uh, the right appearance, the right energy, and it's going to be video for a while longer. It's going to be electronic. So if you if you think about the ways your background, and again, if you're going to use those artificial backgrounds, maybe think about getting a green screen because all of these first impressions, and Malcolm Gladwell did a really good book called Blink that talks about seconds. We just have seconds when people evaluate us. And um, you know, people think about changing hair color, they and be careful. I I tend to say, do let a professional do it if you're going to have your hair colored. Um, it's fine. Just I've had too many clients that did it themselves and it looked pretty awful. Um, but um, the appearance you've got, just make sure you're appropriate. All the obvious things. But these days, it really is a, a changing landscape with uh, with um, 
Zoom and all these other ways of connecting. And you just don't want to look tired and old, <laughs> especially you can slap yourself a little bit, get some color in your cheeks um, and, and see what you can do. Uh, questions they ask you, you know, typically I think the, the best schooled interviewers are asking behaviorally based questions. They're going to ask you questions about, tell me a time when, give any example of, because again, the, the axiom is the best predictor of future performance is prior performance in similar circumstances. So you're going to get questions about, tell me a time when. And I had already mentioned earlier that if you're getting questions about so tell me a time when you screwed up, a uh, something you're, you're short on, your weakness question, the, the dreaded weakness questions. Um, remember, you want to have a, an example like, uh, you know, I can't think of any ongoing major flaws, but I can tell you that, uh, that I, I, did, I did have a screw up in, in my, my last job. Here's what happened and name it. And your story should reveal that you took responsibility you took action to fix the problem and you learn from it. And by the way, the same kind of situation came up six months later and I was much better at dealing with it. So what you've got is not a, a lingering weakness or victim-like situation, but rather you're human, you make mistakes, you come up short. And when you learn from your mistakes and it makes you stronger and better, and also you're trustworthy because you're not gonna hide your weaknesses or mistakes under the rug. So, so, so you probably have other questions that, that are dreaded questions for you, but that's, those are a couple. And they're asking you questions, again, trying to make sure that they're clear on, um, on your, mostly your ability, your motivation, and your fit. Because you're qualified, but they're wondering, are you still driven? When you look back and talk about achievements, that's great, but that's in the past. They're wondering also today. Are you passionate in such a way that your future looks like it'll be a high achieving future? Because that's what everybody wants, a high achieving future for this role. So yes, look back, but also speak with, a, with passion and excitement about what's ahead of you, what's down the road for this job and the, and the engagement that you're gonna have with this job. And at a certain point, they're gonna say, okay, what questions do you have for me? And I've, I think my bias has always been clarifying questions clarifying questions because it's not the kind of question where it's, you know, it's all about me, it's all about them still, especially in the beginning phase. I often say that if, if this is the, the experience of, of interviews or along the line, in the beginning, they wanna make sure the questions you ask are about how, how they need you to serve them. What do they really need? Clarifying what they need and, and communicating that you've got what they need if you do. But as you get closer and closer, you can ask tougher questions then because you, they're not gonna to wanna to reveal too much uh, vulnerability until you're a serious candidate because they don't wanna have somebody who's not a serious candidate get too much information about the company and the, the pluses, the minuses. But you can certainly always talk about um, what are the, um, the opportunities and the challenges and to talk about the opportunities and challenges as somebody that uh, is a problem solver. If it's a challenge, you're a problem solver and you can maybe reference how you've solved similar problems in the past as they have. And if it's opportunities, how you could get excited about those opportunities. And also it might bring to mind some stories where you face similar um, opportunities and been successful and link the pa your past with their present and their future. So the clarifying questions, um, strengths and challenges, you know, you can ask them uh, about those things because when you frame it not as a weakness, but as a challenge, it's a challenge to overcome. It's not a weakness that might be judged by you because if you ask too many probing questions about their weaknesses or their, or their problems, um, it can make them a little bit nervous and maybe you do ask questions more like that down the road, but it's also part of what you're doing for your homework outside of the interview, learning the pluses and minuses about the organization. And in the close, that uh, fourth point, the close is more about, I think the three big things. And I think if you look at the eight items I mentioned, I'd always say that the top three are always ability, motivation, and fit. And, and as one of the questions was asked, the ability to do the work, the ability also to learn, and the ability to be a continual learner, the ability to get along with people that are younger than you, the, the, the stories that you can tell about having younger bosses or working well with multi-generational um, and multi-racial uh, environments. So basically they wanna know, you believe, 
Now that you've heard all about what they really need, you've clarified what they really need, you can communicate that you've got the ability, you've got the motivation, you've got the fit. And again, you're erring on the side of positivity unless you're, you're seeing some glaring issues where maybe you don't wanna walk but run away from this opportunity. But the problem is a lot of times we have mixed feelings in the interview situation. And then the next morning you might realize, well, I was over, over waiting something that was a concern for me. Maybe it isn't such a big concern. Um, so err on the side of positive, but know that they're judging you mostly on ability, motivation, and fit. Can you do the job? Are you driven and excited about this job? And will you get along well with, within our, our organization? Will you inspire people? And when it comes to that fit, I wanna point out one thing that's a common thing about uh, leadership, especially leadership jobs. Most organizations want a builder and a driver. So as you're communicating your capabilities, especially those of you that wanna be leaders out there, um, the fit is, as you're able to build up the capacities, build up the capabilities, inspire, communicate, um, make your help make your people as, as strong as they can be, as capable as they can be, and at the same time, be a driver who, you know, inevitably things get behind schedule, um, budgets maybe start to get taxed. You've got to be a driver too. So we have stories for your driver self, have stories for your builder self, because most employers want both of those things in terms of the fit for the job and the ability and that you're motivated to do both and you know the, the the fun jobs and the tough jobs as well so in the close again ability motivation and fit and then negotiations i'm just going to give you a couple things and then, then we'll move on to more q a the three key elements for negotiating are this uh, first finding out what the market pays for the work that you're looking at. And that would be an internet search or job postings or conversations with people. Um, I remember there was a book, David, you remember this too, the book title way back, and I wouldn't recommend the book, but it's a great title, How to Make $1,000 a Minute, right? Uh, David's probably smiling right now because he remembers that book. Uh, what, what happens is where you're starting to say, okay, I first need to understand what does the market pay so that I can find out generically um, what the ballpark is for this job. But you have to also move to the second point, which is what should this organization pay for this work? And uh, you know, sometimes it's a smaller organization that might not have the deep pockets that a larger organization has, but maybe they'll make up for that in bonus or some kind of equity, some way to level the playing field. But a nonprofit, um, don't assume they're all like this, but oftentimes it's about 75% of what a for-profit will pay. Sometimes maybe only half, but other times a large nonprofit, for instance, might pay the same as a large organization. But the main thing is to look at the organization that, that you're interviewing with and, and try to figure out where should they be paying, uh, at what rate, what range. And the final thing is where should I land on the range? And that's a bell-shaped curve. And that bell-shaped curve has a midpoint. And there should be some understanding and a conversation between you and the hiring manager about where would, would it be that they would place you. At the end of the interview process, you have a better sense of the duties and they have a better sense of your capabilities. So the question is, uh, where do they place you on the range and why? And it should make some sense. Usually if you're above the midpoint, 70th, 80th percentile, you're value added, maybe harder to find and maybe they want to pay a premium for you. If you're at the 30th, 40%, uh, is that right? Does that fit with your level of experience? Maybe that's undervaluing you for what you bring, or if, maybe there's a lot to learn. Maybe it's a job where you have, a, you have a lot to catch up on. Maybe you do belong in the 30th or 40th percentile, but the 50th percentile tends to be about, about right for a hit the ground running and fully qualified. So the main thing is just to have a conversation about the logic that was used and where you were placed on that bell-shaped curve. So those are the three main points. What, is, what should the market pay? More importantly, what should this organization pay? And where do I land on the range? And can I, can I accept or do I need to challenge where they place me on the range? Okay, Harry, you ready for a few more questions? We do have a few. Um, okay. One of them, I love this. She says she can't find it right now, but there's research that shows that playing your favorite music and dancing right before an interview puts you in the mindset you need to be for that interview. Have you heard that? Uh, that's great. Yeah. And you can watch Amy Cuddy, go to Amy Cuddy TED Talks, and she'll, she'll talk about fake it till you become it. 
and uh, she talks about how to do the you know, the Wonder Woman uh, pose in the bathroom before an interview. I, I, I like that TED talk about um, it could be music, it could be uh, you know body posture. Watch that TED talk. You should be able to find it. Just go to Amy Cuddy, C U D D Y, I think it is. A TED Talk. Um, it's like the third most popular TED Talk ever made, but it's about overcoming self-doubt and using uh, physicality. And I'd include music uh, to to get one um, bigger and stronger and and more positive. It's a great suggestion. Great. Another question is: Should you always give a range when they ask what salary you're looking for, and how broad of a range? Ten thousand dollars or more or less? Well, I think it, it can, it depends on what level you're at. Uh, at the lower levels, that range, uh, if it's $10,000, that might be a pretty wide range. But up at the higher levels, it might be you know, 10, 20,000. I think that um, the main thing is to do your homework in advance um, and, and know what your expectations uh, are based on what your research has taught you. Uh, but you know, the main thing is to say, you know, I, you know, the main thing I want is uh, that two things, um, that whatever salary is offered to me, that it is consistent with the marketplace and consistent with your organization, with the size and type of organization you are, that's number one. And number two, it, that you've, you've, that I'm placed on the range uh, in the right spot that, that factors in my uh, capabilities and my ability to contribute in the future. Um, I'm, you can say I'm confident we'll come up with, you know, you're a good organization, I'm confident we'll come up with, with, uh, with a number that works, but be prepared, they might press you and, you know, have a range in mind. Um, you might be asked and, and the main thing is dismiss what is in the past as much as you can as far as the relevance to it, not dismiss it, but just keep it in perspective is probably a better word that what you made, you know, the, that was then, this is now, because again, some of you might be looking at a downshift of a level or two and your old salary, your old job, the tenure in your old company might not allow you to make quite the same as you made before. So they want you to be objective, uh, relatively unemotional and, and optimistic and fair so that you're, you're gonna be reasonable to work with, um, but you do have to do your homework to, to really be able to share any kind of a range. Someone says that uh, when they've been asked, there's been times when they've been asked in the interview whether they have any questions and that it came across as if it was almost a challenge, like you better not have any questions. <laughs> how, do you, how do you deal with something like that? Well, every interviewer is a little bit different. Um, yeah, it sounds like there might've been some defensiveness on the part of that person. Uh, again, we, you get all types to do interviews, but um, you have to maintain your um, composure and positivity. And when, if they're asking if you have any questions, um, yeah, the question is, do they really want you uh, to ask any questions or are they, are they defensive? But um, or they might feel like it's, they're out of time and they want to get on their next meeting. But I think, um, I think there always is room for a question or two. And you, if you need to probe and say, um, boy, I know that we're, our interview has gone fairly long. Um, do we have time for maybe one or two questions? And you, you can put it back on the person if it seems like they're, um, they're asking in that kind of a, a defensive or aggressive tone, put it back to them and see where they're at and see if they really do want to hear uh, any questions or how many or how much time do we have left? So just always be considerate of the interviewer because they might have something else going on. They might be way over schedule and they're, they're getting anxious about their next meeting and you could be considerate to them. And I think they'll appreciate it. I had a couple of questions earlier that were related to everybody they're interviewing with is 20 or more years younger than they are. And they felt like they're doomed from the beginning. How do you, <laughs> how do you address that? Well, again, one of the things to think about is, can you give any stories about working in the past, you know, name the white elephant in the room, you know, I, I try to think about where you've worked in the past, hopefully, it, it, you'll have something where you can pull out to say not only uh, maybe a boss was 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 younger than you, uh, certainly teammates maybe on a team were younger than you. And again, it's the car story, the challenge action results and the way you work with younger uh, bosses or peers or subordinates and think of some stories, think of some examples. What have people said about you as far as what you're like to work with uh, when people are 10, 15 
years younger, I think stories can help diffuse it, maybe sort of naming the white elephant in the room in a non-defensive tone, in a positive tone, with some actual examples of having worked with younger bosses, peers, or subordinates. I think it'll help uh, diffuse things. Um, and if you don't have that in your background, it, it does make it a little bit tough, but you can, you can still be optimistic about that. It's just, it's a little bit better if you have tangible examples, either in volunteer work, outside of work, or better still in your professional uh, experiences. Had uh, Kathy just makes a comment saying she had a situation she, where she was running late for an interview and in a rush, sat down, connected to Zoom and, and rocked the interview, best performance she had. So she, she got in late, but it worked out okay? That's probably the level of energy made her better in the interview. <laughs> Don't do that too often. <laughs> no. But uh, yeah, I think sometimes, um, you know, it kind of harkens back to college. Some of, some of us did those all-nighters and, uh, you know, might say that they did it better. But uh, I think uh, to each their own. Some people operate better uh, last minute. But I do want to reiterate the point where you don't want to be overly prepared. You don't want to be obsessed with this and have a meeting scheduled an hour or two after your interview um, so that you're not putting everything onto this interview. And remember, you're competing against people, many of whom have had a busy day and they're, they're not as prepared, but they're coming across as more authentic and less obsessed with the job. So this gave me an opportunity to kind of reiterate that. Don't be overly prepared um, or overly obsessed with this is the thing. This is it. Agreed. We don't have any other questions right now, and we're at the end of our time. George, well, thank perfect. you so much. This perfect. was uh, very helpful. And Thank I will you. turn it back to Tom. All right. Thanks, Harry. Thank you, George. Uh, it was great to hear your uh, your uh, stories and, and your talk tonight. I think it was very helpful, uh, very informative, and uh, wish uh, we had more time uh, because uh, you you were always you're presenting more and more information. So it's great. Thank you for being here tonight. We do appreciate it. Uh, thank you to um, Becky for sharing her career uh, transition story. I think it was very important and uh, enlightening and uh, gave us perspective. And thank you to Harry for being in the background doing what he does uh, so successfully. Uh, the maestro and uh, the radio voice for those questions, there's no one better. Uh, you will receive an email tomorrow uh, with many links to the information we talked about tonight. Uh, the recording of the webinar is available on our YouTube channel, and you'll find information about that on our website. Um, also, you should check out our website to check out the next eight-week course, which is going to be starting on February 23rd, Tuesday at 6 to 7.30. So uh, if that works into your schedule and you're looking for a course to help you with your, your job search skills, um, that would be a great uh thing to look into. Networking every Thursday morning uh, at, with Grace. Uh, check that out on the website, sign up, uh, get uh, into it, and, uh, and expand your network and hopefully network yourself into the next job. One-on-one uh, -on -one help. Yeah, like I said, on the website, we have uh, critical help available, so go check that out and get it where you need it. And the prayer support is always there for you when you need it. Our next seminar will be Thursday morning uh, February 18th, uh, it starts at 7.30 uh, to 9, and join Jennifer Radke as she helps you drive your LinkedIn success by giving uh, strategic connections, uh, titled Advanced uh, LinkedIn Techniques to Make Powerful Connections. So uh, Jennifer spoke many times. She's very good at what she does, and uh, she's a leader in the end in the LinkedIn uh, world and uh, we'll provide you with a lot of information there to really make your LinkedIn work for you. Uh, again, that would be uh, February 18th. Uh, find the details on our seminars page. And I uh, hope this is worth your while today. Uh, best wishes in your uh, search. Have a productive next couple of weeks. And uh, if you haven't uh, found an opportunity by then, please join us uh, and uh, rev up your batteries for your job search in the next seminar. Uh, here at Crossroads. Uh, good night.